So what is the greatest irrigation scheme in the ancient world? So that's what we are going to discuss in this. First, uh, we have to come up with a criteria. You know, I mean, what criteria that we are going to use and what is required from an irrigation scheme. So to give you an idea, sometimes you run into people who talk about who was the greatest soccer player ever played the game. And then someone would say Messi, Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo, Ronaldo, the Brazilian one, um, Maradona, Pele, you know, those are the names that are thrown around. So you have to ask, um, is, what is the criteria that you are going to use? Are you going to use the dribbling ability? Can it could be uh, Ronaldo of Brazil. Are you going to use striking capabilities, then it would be Karl Heinz Rummeniger or Cristiano Ronaldo, somebody like that. So we have to come up with a criteria. So the criteria I selected was in an irrigation scheme, what do we expect? We want irrigation schemes are basically to transport water. So if you are living near the river, and if your paddy field or if your house is near the river, you just go to the river and get, get water, no problem. But when the population expanded, people lived far away from water sources, rivers and reservoirs, etc. So when that happens, the water has to be transported to where people live for agriculture, for use, for the houses, etc. So, volume of water transported is important. And um, then you have to see if the scheme has storage capacity. Because um, in all countries undergo dry periods. So, when there's a dry season comes, when there's an abnormally long dry period comes, then you have to have water stored in the scheme. If you don't have storage ability in the scheme, then it is not a complete irrigation system. And then to build the system, you need a certain amount of technology. You know how much technology is required. And then work involved. You know how much work involved. And then since we are talking ancient so we should be able to confirm the antiquity that these structures that we see today are really indeed ancient you know sometimes structures are gone but then in that situation we have to see whether there's historical documents that we could trust exist um, so that's the number five and number six is is the scheme unique in the world? You know, the scheme that we consider. So these are the six things that I considered to find what is the greatest irrigation scheme in the ancient world. So we have to first see, you know, with the significant volume of water transported through the system, the significant volume of water stored, because these two things are expected from any irrigation scheme and technology required. You know, I mean, if something easily done or you need a lot of technology, a lot of know-how needed and whether it can be done with few people or you need millions of people working and then you have need management and etc. And confirmation of antiquity and the uniqueness in the world. So though these are the six um, criteria that I used. So um, I considered schemes. I looked around and I found this Puntugard aqueduct scheme built by the Romans existing in France. Which we are going to talk in detail what that is. And then I disc, um, looked at Kalava Vajaganda uh, scheme built by Pandukabir, the Amantirti, the 
in Sri Lanka, these, this scheme, and then the Alara scheme of Vasubhamasin, etc. So these three schemes I looked at it and then I'm going to compare Ponto God versus the Alara scheme. For some reason I picked the Alara scheme. Now you may ask, what about India? There was a technological powerhouse in the ancient world. And what about China? That was a technological powerhouse in the ancient world. They had uh, all kinds of medicines, buildings, navies, uh, militaries. So how come I didn't pick any schemes from these two countries? These were, you know, obviously ancient cultures and they were rice producing countries. The problem is most of these schemes in India and China are canals. There are a lot of canal systems, but there was no storage. They were not able to store water. Storing water that you would find if you listen to this webcast totally. I mean, I know most people would cut away and get bored. But if you listen to the whole webcast, you would see that the storing water is not easy as one would think. Water is not, water is like a wild elephant. It's not easy to control. It has a lot of power, it has a lot of abilities, it goes through pores and it's relentless. It keeps working and working and working to get out. So storing water is not easy as you, you think. And that may be the reason why you don't, you don't see these large reservoirs that you see in Sri Lanka, in India and China. So one may ask, how about other rice producing countries in India? Because rice requires a lot of water. It's a, a grain that needs a lot of water, unlike corn or a wheat. Rice needs a lot of water. So how about other rice producing countries? Indonesia, Japan, Vietnam, etc. Same problem. They had uh, ancient cultures. But um, no significant story. They had canals. And um, that's basically was the reason that I cannot pick any schemes from those countries. And um, what about Middle East, Egypt, Babylonia? Again, mostly canals. You don't see much storage. And some of the structures were destroyed and new structures were built. It's easy, not easy to confirm, you know, what was claimed and uh, a lot of issues. It's difficult for me to pinpoint this structure and this scheme and built in this era. And this is the storage, this is the transportation system, etc. So that was the problem there. So let's talk about the Pont to Guard scheme of France built by the Romans. So it's an aqueduct, you know, so it's an aqueduct. It's a structure built from rock and stones, built from stones. And as you could see, there are three layers of arches, first layer, second layer, third layer. And it's another photo of the aqueduct. And this is the inside of the aqueduct. This is where the water is going through. And as you could see, it's like six feet horizontally and maybe six to seven feet vertically. And the water goes to this, this aqueduct. And this is the very top. And before the water get to the aqueduct, it comes through a tunnel in the, in the, in the mountain, which we are going to see. And then eventually water come to a place like this. This is a bathing area. And as you could see, there's a hole. So water is transported all the way from the mountains through the tunnel, through the aqueduct. And then eventually it would come to a bathing place like this. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. 
So people would sit around and there's a little pond here. They would sit around, they jump in here, they bed. There are other places to sit around here with their towels and, you know, so. And that water that was miles away in mountains now come into the city through tunnels, through aqueducts, and uh, through canals. Pretty amazing. Um, so here's another photo of the aqueduct that's coming. So basically, as you could see here, this aqueduct get connected to a tunnel. You know, the tunnel that you saw here, this tunnel. So it, this tunnel just goes, water just goes straight to an aqueduct. So the tunnel opens into this aqueduct and then the water flows through, like something like that. So they built a, so there has to be some kind of a water source, some river here, and then they built a, some kind of a structure, and then they built a tunnel, and the water comes along the tunnel, and then goes to the aqueduct, and then taken to the city. So pretty, pretty amazing, pretty, um, a lot of technology um, required to uh, do this. We are going to see what kind of technology was required to build a system like that. So we are going to go through all that. So now we go through the Alahara irrigation scheme and there's a river. So the river is flowing like that. <coughs> and then there's an anicut. And instead of building a dam across, they built a side where they just guided the water and the water comes through. And then it will be crossing many other streams. You know, that's pretty amazing. You, you had to cross other streams. And then you would have uh, sluice gates and water would be taken out to um, smaller storage tanks and the green is the paddy field. So it goes to a smaller storage tank and to the paddy field and cascade system it is known. So it's a cascade system. And the water would flow. This uh, this river is called a perennial river, which means water is kind of permanently flowing. So the water would come along here and then on its way, it could cross various natural streams. That's pretty amazing. You know, the water would come here and the stream would take the water that way. So they have to adjust, make some structures here so the water would flow where they want to flow. And then the water would get to these large reservoirs. Minneri, Kaudulla and Kantale, three large reservoirs, and then smaller one, Giritale. I mean, alone is 5,000 acres surface area. So how big is an acre? One acre is about 20, 20 tennis courts. You know, if you imagine a tennis court, 20 of them. Imagine an area of 20 tennis courts. And that's one acre. So that's just the surface area of Minneri. Is 5,000 acres. How many, how much water? It's like um, 100,000 acre feet of water stored. Um, that translates into 1,300 million cubic meters. Whole lot of water. And then these two are much smaller than Mineri. Slightly smaller, not much smaller. And then water goes to the uh, Mineri and then goes to another reservoir into a paddy field and a reservoir so it has this cascading system and each of these systems here have a whole lot of other things here and we are going to talk about that so this is the basic of the Alara scheme it has an anchor diversion scheme from a main river a canal that goes through all kinds of other streams and obstructions and then go to large reservoirs 
and um, from there I could go to other smaller reservoirs and paddy fields. So that's the Alahara scheme. So here's some photograph. This is the Anikut. This is the Anikut where the um, water is transported. So the water is going flowing, overflowing. When the water level is high, it's designed that way to overflow into the canal. So if you look here, the canal was supposed to be here. You now it's not there anymore. This one is better. So the water comes like that. They built this structure that's the Anika parallel to the river and then corral the water through this canal. The water would just flow over it here when the water level is high. And um, so that's the you know, normal flow of the river. And then they built this Anika and then water would be transported this way. And they built small tunnels. Not big tunnels like in Rome, but small tunnels to divert water in small amounts, not too far, maybe a few feet, few yards. And this is another picture. Of <coughs> and then this is the Alahara Canal path, mile post zero. Among rivers was dammed and water was diverted. Mile post four, canal crosses the Congeta Oya. Mile Force 5, canal crosses the Tindagala Alla River, etc. So these, this, the canal crossing these existing rivers is pretty amazing. You know, you have to uh, set your elevations properly, otherwise water would just disappear with the existing river. And on its way, they build sluice gates and etc. And then the water would come to a to reservoir, this is Mineri. You could see the bun here, huge storage. Now you could see the bun. This this is Kantale, another one. And normally the road, you know, it's a two-lane road, probably like 25 feet, because each each lane needs at least 12 feet. So probably 25 feet, and give or take a few feet on the sides. So you're looking at a 30 foot on the top. And in the bottom, you could see from here to here, probably like six of these and another six of these. So probably like 300 feet at the base. And it extends down. And we would see to build this amount of work involved. And technology is you need to know the strength of soils, etc. So it's something like this. This is the bond. Then this is the sluice gate where the water was taken out. And the pressure control system is called the Bisokotor. And uh, this is one of the major inventions of engineers of Sri Lanka to control the pressure and the flow. <coughs> so the, instead of water flowing through high pressure, they would break it here and then you could control your head could control your flow. I have a whole different um, video cast on this one. If you want interested, you could um, check on that. And then eventually water would go to the swimming pools, paddy fields. You know, they had these structures in the city. This is another swimming pool. So the amount of work involved is huge in this, this scheme. And um, you know, Henry Ward, gone of Ceylon, 1856, says, No wisdom and no power in the ruler can have forced such efforts even upon the most passive oriental nations without general persuasion that the work was one of paramount necessity, that all would participate in its benefits. So, various comments about the work involved. Is the craftsmanship in one of the Bisoko tours. And um, the amount of cost involved, you know, was calculated. Um, so now let's look at um, technical knowledge. 
required in Portugal. So, as I said, um, Romans have to get the water from a river at, in the mountain, high, gra high, high ground, and they have to know tunneling. They have to know tunneling. They have to tunnel to rock and soil. And then during tunneling, you have to maintain the stability in the rock, in the tunnel roof. You have to maintain the stability. And you have to have amazing surveying knowledge. Um, so if you, if you, this is a tunnel. So you say you find some bad rock and then they remove that rock. And then they put uh, new new stones with with the amazing plasters that they had, high strength plasters. They would uh, uh, they had that technology, and they have to know the rock mechanics, you know, rock joint patterns and rock strike. What is rock joints? Every rock in the world, you know, not every rock, most rocks have joints or fractures like that. So you need to know where these, these are the weak points, the rock, the, the tunnel roof could fail from here, this rock could slide down. So they have to position the tunnel, avoid in these type of situations, or they have to put plasters and break it here, plasters, all kinds of things. And then other than the joints or fractures, these have naturally occurring, um, sedimentary layers and that also is a problem they have to know all this and amazing surveying knowledge normally tunnels are built from two sides you know you don't build from one side and go like that because you want to go fast you would build from this side and that side and eventually you would meet um, I personally don't want to be the surveyor who is responsible for this type of work and even with great equipment you have today, this is a very tough thing to do, you know. And um, they made it happen, you know, they made it work, you know, you have to meet. You have to meet here. If you don't meet, you know, you, you have to, you got a problem. So the Romans have to have amazing knowledge on survey. And um, they have to um, be able to handle water seepage in rock tunnels. So they have to have waterproof plasters when when the when you're tunneling you would find seepage. You know, water would seep seep down the groundwater. So you have to find those areas and plaster it so it stop uh, water from coming down. And then they have to know the they have to have structural knowledge in building aqueducts for the wind loading, load transfer using arches. So if you take an aqueduct like that, amount of wind load on these are immense. You know, this thing could topple over. Today we have, you have steel, you have steel and base plates and boats. You could bolt it down and then you could have the structure in steel columns. Or you could do concrete structure and then go down to the foundation underneath to a, some kind of a caisson. But they didn't have base plates and rock boards. Also, sorry, base plates and steel boards. So how did they do it? How did they... They had amazing plasters. You know, these rocks were held by plasters and the weight itself. So they were able to pull it off and they, the structure still stands after thousand, thousand of years. So pretty amazing engineering. And on top of that, you have to maintain the slope. This is water has to flow. You build this amazing structure. If the water is not flowing, what's the point? So you have to maintain the slope at, at there. And so these measurements that they take from the ground level to up should be very precise, very precise. So, and that is um, amazing uh, engineering here, structural knowledge, structural engineering is required. And what is the historical confirmation uh, 
of Aqueda. We got pretty much pretty a lot, lot of documentation in, in both schemes. El Arab scheme, Gamaons and inscriptions and and then same thing with the Pontu God scheme, all kinds of documents available. And um, so now we look at the technology required for the Alahara scheme. Um, so I'm going to stop here and um, I'm going to do this in part two just to keep these videos at a shorter length. So please join part two of this uh, webcast. Thanks a lot for listening.